Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. I hope I can live up to that introduction. Um, firstly, I can't tell you how cool it is to be among so many educators, really, because the last time I was in front of a, a school principal, my parents were called for. <laughs> and this is really, really cool. In fact, I'm not kidding. It was in the second grade. I was caught drawing the bust of a nude by Michelangelo. And I was sent to my school principal, who was a sweet nun. She looked through all the nudes in my book, and she slapped me on my face and said, sweet Jesus, this kid has already begun at the second grade. I didn't know what she was talking about. I was copying my mother, who was an artist who loved Michelangelo. Well, it was, the shouting was good enough for me never to draw again until the ninth grade. And thanks to a really boring lecture, I was caricaturing my teachers. And I said, oh, no, not again. I don't want to get caught again. <laughs> so this time what I did is I, I glorified my school principal. I made a portrait, put him right on top, all the other teachers below him, and I gifted it to him. <laughs> he had a good laugh at the other teachers and put it up on the notice board. I became a school hero. <laughs> and uh, and it, was, it was really wonderful. This is in India, by the way. I'm from Bangalore. You know, I'm not the smartest kid in class. My brother's a super nerd and super smart. And I'm not the richest kid. I don't have the fanciest gadgets. And so cartooning gave me a sense of identity. You know, I really was proud of myself, thanks to cartooning. I, wanted, I want to tell you a little bit about my family. This is my mom. I love her to bits. I always put her in my presentations. She's the one who taught me how to love. You know, and she's a bit of a hippie. She said, never say that, but she is. Um, <laughs> The rest of my family are boring academics collecting Ivy League decals for our classic ambassador car. That's the only use, I think, for them. <laughs> and my father's a bit different. Um, my father's a bit of a holistic guy. He's a spiritual dude. In fact, he hated our school system. He said, you know, our education is hijacked by industrial revolution. And he believed that school is about, about all these things, discipline, curiosity, learning how to learn, all of this stuff. While he held this world view, I, my brothers and I, as witnesses, I sat him down when he was having his favorite whiskey. I said, Pa, you know, I've decided I'm going to be very hardworking. I'm going to be curious about the world. I'm going to be disciplined. All of this stuff. And he was getting, I said, I'm going to emotionally and financially be self-sufficient. He was like, oh. And I said, wait, don't tear up. Hold that thought. Can I quit school? <laughs> And this is when I was 16. The poor man's philosophy was used against him. I quit formal education to become a cartoonist. Okay? And, um, and you know, that is when my unlearning started. Um, I grew up in a little bubble in India. I really didn't, I'm a pretty traditional family, academic family. And only when I started traveling, I realized there are all kinds of families. Dads can be moms, moms can be dads, anything can happen in the world. And I really learned about the world from, by traveling. I went, while I was traveling, my cartoonist heroes that I would write to said, work with children. They're the most creative creatures on this planet. And you will learn cartooning if you work with them. Because I was going to the famous cartoonists and saying, will you teach me? I want to work under you. They like, work with kids. So I started my own school. But think about this. An 18-year-old in India starting a cartoon school. Nobody's going to listen to me. I knew I needed some, uh, some push you know, some credibility. I found out that the Prime Minister of India was visiting my hometown. I thought, he's a good guy to help me along. So I, I decided to go to the place where his helicopter was landing. And I landed up there, and I saw layers of security. And I was like, oh my god, I can't meet him. Um, duh. <laughs> um, I, I tried to impress the guards. I caricatured my way through three layers, and then I got stuck. And that's when I saw a car pull up. And uh, this professor in whose house I'd done caricatures sort of recognized me and said, hey, Raghava, what are you doing here? I said, I'm here to meet the, uh, receive the prime minister. I'm here to see the prime minister. He said, oh, so am I. I hopped into his car. <laughs> Off we went through the many layers of security. <laughs> and I met the prime minister, sat him down, caricatured him, and kick-started my cartoon academy. I took that all over the world. I traveled to Belgium, to France. I'd never been on a plane before that. And in doing so, I put myself in really vulnerable situations. And that's when I think I really started learning. Um, oops. Oh, that's the caricature of the prime minister that I had done. 
I started painting in my travels. I met artists and I didn't learn how to paint. I didn't know how to use a brush. You know, they just scare you, these art, art supply stores. So I decided to paint with my hands and feet and they were large. And over a, f a few years I met, I fell in love with this girl in New York while I was traveling. And she, she was like, she was 16, I was eight, uh, she was 17, I was 19. I'm not a cradle snatcher. Um, <laughs> she was amazing. And, and, and she was like, you know, why don't you move to America? I have to finish high school, I have to finish college. I'm like, who cares about those things? Anyway, um, so I moved to America and we started selling my cartoons from a van and my paintings. Over, by the age of 23, uh, I must say, we had made a million dollars in that, when I was 23. I was selling my work to rock stars, to celebrities. Benazir Bhutto was a collector of my work. It was really exciting. Art had taken me everywhere. I thought of myself as a bit of a rock star. Everything was going perfect. See, I was in the papers every year. And so my wife, and my girlfriend and I then said, let's celebrate, let's have a wedding. Okay, by the way, I just wanna clarify, I'm an old person, I'm 32. I have two kids and she's my wife now. Just to contextualize things. And so my wife and I decided to get married and we put a modest list, guest list, of 7,000 people to celebrate my wedding. And it was the biggest art installation you could think of. I won't elaborate, but we had dancers, artists, DJs, firecracker installation artists. And, oops. Uh, it was called the Big Fat Indian Wedding. And <laughs> And it was all over, all over uh, India. It was really fun. But in the midst of all this excitement and fun, something tragic happened. My mother felt very sick. And I couldn't hold that enthusiasm and that charisma and that love for life. My work's turned really dark. I had to be honest, you know. Um, I'm going to show you some dark stuff. Um, these are works that I did from the, my gut. I wanted people to feel it in their gut. As you could imagine, from the beautiful paintings that I was creating, oops, from the beautiful work that I was creating, nobody wanted to buy these. All my collectors disappeared. The Bollywood stars ran away. The press said, hi, nice seeing you, and turned the other direction. It was really a life lesson. At this point, I really decided that my life and my art really inform each other. Uh, my wife said, I w I, she's passionate about teaching, so my wife is a high school history teacher. And, um, uh, and she said, I'll come to America, I'll finish my education and be a teacher. So we packed our bags and moved to America with a little baby. I reached Park Slope, that's where I live now. At that time I thought I was really cool because I was a stay-at-home dad, an artist, with a little kid, a stroller, a dog, and I was cool. But everyone in Park Slope is a stay-at-home dad who is an artist or a musician with a kid and a dog that looks better than yours. I'm like, I found my people. <laughs> Except, for, except I refused to join the co-op. Anyway, we won't get into that. Um, but I did, um, oops. So when, when I had a child, my work turned whimsical. I started sort of celebrating. I know I started, stopped taking myself that seriously. And my works were more trivial and fun, like this. Um, my art and my life really, really inform one another. Soon after, a recent success, Ted invited me to speak. It was the most bizarre experience because I had lost all my notoriety. I was back down in the dumps and I was speaking at Ted. I was speaking with Al Gore, Bill Gates and all these guys and it really was an amazing opening for me. Um, after speaking there, this is, I'm going to try to make this quick, um, I was gifted an iPad and this is a bit of a secret but it was Bill Gates' company that gifted me an iPad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so I was invited to speak with Bill Gates and Vinod Khosla at a conference. And I'm like, this must be a message from God. If Bill Gates is giving me an iPad, I should do something about it. And I thought, I'll gift it to my wife and gain some brownie points, because she loves to read. And so I gifted it to her. I'm dyslexic, I don't read. So I gifted it to my wife, and she's like, nah, I need to smell my books, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> So I'm like, and so she gave it to my son, who was one year old, and he, that kid was using the iPad like he had a PhD in, in iPad. So I was like, he doesn't listen to me, he listens to that thing, that's his father. So I decided to communicate to him through, the, through, through the, my replacement. Um, so I created a children's book called Pop It with my wife, 
And it's a book. It's a very simple book. It's about what parents do with children. And it's like potty training, changing, the cute things that parents do. Except it's like a mom and dad that bring up a child. When you shake it, you have a lesbian couple bringing up a child. You shake it, and you have a homosexual couple, a gay couple bringing up a child. The idea was to shake up the concept of an ideal family, shake up uh, everything. And the iPad allowed me to do that. So this is um, soon after the iPad came out, Ted decided to launch the iPad um, and the, the app. And it, it's created some amazing response. That's my wife. Uh, I love her, too. Her name is Netra. But I hate history, and she's a history teacher. And I said, Nates, you live in the past. I will create the future. And you can study about it when I'm done. <laughs> and she, she, she said, as a punishment for saying that, you're sitting in on one of my classes. And that to an Indian history class, too. I'm Indian. I know my history. I've been studying that all my life. So I went and sat in on a class, and I was blown away. This was in America. She asked the kids to, to so she gave them primary source documents from different sides. That was amazing. Then she said, separate fact from bias. I'm like, what? There are facts, bias? Cool. And then she said something even more beautiful. She said, make up your own story of dignity using the facts and biases. She said, history is the most creative exercise that gives dignity to a people. And she said, it's purely creative. It's full of biases. And let's celebrate the biases. I saw history completely differently. She argued with me that if I'm creative, these guys are far more creative than me. So I went back and I did an entire exhibition. In the meanwhile, there was a collective that was formed to shake up everything. So we shook up history. Imagine a book on India's independence, very faithful and very patriotic. Shake it and you get Pakistan's perspective. Shake it and you get the British perspective. I think that's how history should be taught in the future. Now, these are some of the drawings that, um, these are some works that I did for my exhibitions, using history as an imaging tool. I really believe that if you want to teach empathy, you should teach creativity. Because when you're creative, you can imagine yourself in the shoes of someone different. Now, having said all of this stuff, oops, I want you to indulge me as I shake up education. Uh, this may be a little drastic and dramatic, I know that the exit is over there. So I'm going to say what I have to say. And, and I hope you'll indulge me. Because you know I left school, and I never went back. I've never had a job in the last 15 years, and I've never studied. But it does not mean I have not been educated. I, I use the world as my classroom. And I got, I, I, I've learned so much from people. I'm going to give you five things that I've learned from my unconventional education. It may be a little dramatic. First thing, note to educators, you don't matter. The, the amazing thing is the minute you acknowledge the fact that you don't matter is when you become so effective. You know, the greatest teachers of mine have never tried to teach me. I want to say that you become a participant in the learning process when you don't become self-important. And, and that's when you become a vessel of experience for kids to tap into. Your failures equally important from your successes. That's my first point. Second point, true passion will emerge. Don't mess with it. You go to school to find passion. The minute you find someone who's passionate, let them be. I am so happy no one owns my passion. No one directed. Don't, no one made me a good artist. I am, that's my baby, and I own it. That's the second point. In, uh, the third point I want to make, hire sexy teachers. <laughs> Wait a minute. I think the most charismatic people who can make <laughs> Yay! <laughs> da -da -da -da. You're hired. <laughs> the most charismatic people who can bring the most boring subject to life, the people you fall in love with for their passion, are the kinds of teachers. I feel there's a big problem. There's a big disconnect between what students look for in a teacher and what administration looks for in a teacher. They look at resumes. And, and, and the love and passion for communication is left to chance. Seems a little messed up, if you ask me. Fourth point, the best education does not secure your future. The best education does the opposite. It makes you seek out instability. Because when you're instable, it helps you deal with instability. 
only when you're unstable, instable. Oops, any English teachers? Yeah. <laughs> only when you're not stable do you allow yourself vulnerability. And if you're vulnerable, you learn. And that's the most fundamental thing in education for me. So I think we need to focus on instability a little. Throw the kids in, into a pool and let them swim. <laughs> Not my kids. <laughs> Before I move on to the fifth point, I want to say, you know, one of my heroes, uh, Leonardo, not DiCaprio, Da Vinci. Um, Leonardo Di Da Vinci had this amazing life principle. It was called smooth, fumato. It meant up in smoke. He said everyone should believe and have a comfortable relationship with the mystical and the unknown. I thought that was beautiful. The fifth point is quantity is sometimes more important than quality. Let me explain. My friend Derek Sivers says a beautiful story of a pottery teacher. She broke her class into two sections. One section, she said, um, you make a pot the entire semester. It has to be one pot and the perfect pot. The other group had to make as many pots as they possibly can, and they were judged based on the weight of clay used. OK, it was too dramatic, um, two different approaches. At the end of the, uh, of the week, uh, end of the semester, there was an exhibition, and there were external judges. The top three pots all came from the quantitative group, not from the quality group. Now, this may sound surprising to you, but not to me, because when people come to me and say, how do I become a great artist? I'll say, tomorrow, can you produce 300 drawings? If you do, you're on your way. In fact, you get better if you don't attempt our perfection. N perfection emerges. It's never something you go after. You just work and work and work. Finally, I want to leave you with one thought. This is someone I love. He gave the uh, closing keynote uh, yesterday, Sir Ken Robinson, who I've had the fortune of knowing very well. He said what the world needs is not an evolution in education, but a revolution. And I think all of us agree. And I have to thank Polyvision for this. Um, I'm, I've, I've come here because both Ken Robinson, Polyvision, and I really believe the dreams are what makes us who we are. And unfortunately, education has become a dogmatic religion. It's time we put spirituality back in education. Thank you so much.